Well, hello again. Guess what? It is, it is time to travel through the word. We are traveling through the book of Esther. I'm so excited. Such that it took me forever to do this book because I was trying to narrow down about 50 pages to a sensible amount. Um, that I can make a video because I can't make them all night video. But anyway, I got it narrowed down as much as I possibly could. Um, making sure I left in as much of the meat as possible. So let's get busy here. Let's we're traveling through the word. The book of the Bible that we're working with is Esther. The topic is God working in the background. The things that I said you'll need are all listed. Holy Spirit, paper, pencil, you know, whatever writing tinsel you want, highlighters, access to a Bible dictionary and commentary, things that I use, of course, the Holy Spirit, various Bible translations, commentaries, Bible dictionary, Bible hook, you version, podcast, YouTube sermons. I mean, I, all the things. And so um, I'm going to go through. There's like the section I gave you the outline earlier in the background. And so let's kind of go through this. And we start with when God is working in the background. Now, that is hard for us because we, I don't know why we feel this way, but this just how we are, you know, the joy of being human, I guess. We feel like we should know what God is doing all the time, what he's doing, when he's doing it, why he's doing it, how he's doing it, like all the things. We feel like we have some right to know that, which is amazing to me that the created thing thinks we can tell the creator what to do and how to do it and all the things. Um, but that's how we feel. And so when God is working in the background, that's very difficult for us in a lot of ways because we want to see what he's doing as if we need to approve it or as if we got comments about it. it just it's crazy when you think about it like that. Right. And so Let's talk about Esther and what happened. So we start off in um, chapter one and it this, the first outline starts with the new queen in Susa. Okay. And this is going to kind of take us through from the first chapter all the way to the um, second chapter. And so it starts with this long party at the beginning of the story, the King Xerxes, I uh, I said I was going to like really pronounce this and I practiced on it and I still can't say it now. So King H, King A is what I'm going to call him. King Xerxes or King A. He was having this huge party. And I mean, the party was like, they say it was like 180 days. So you know how long that is. That's a long time. Months and months and months is what was happening with that. And the way they did parties back then is like he, it was a way to display how much power you had because remember King Xerxes at that time was a pretty powerful king. I mean, he had 127 provinces that he was, you know, over. So his land, you know, was from one end, you know, to the of the world to a whole nother end of the world. And so different people got invited different times, you know, so maybe, you know, this few days, these princes came and then the next set of princes came in. So he did that for 180 days. And then for seven days, he had the common people come. OK. And so um, remember, Daniel had already prophesied that, you know, what was going to happen. Persia would become dominant nation and the great king whom Daniel he prophesied about would rise to power, which was King Xerxes. And he prophesied about that in 11, too. And so King, the king has this big party and um, he decides to call his queen after there was much drinking involved. OK, and there's a lots of rules in the background about drinking. Um, some parts, they said whenever the king drank, you would have to drink. That was a common thing in some parts of the world. And then in some parts of the world, everybody had to drink out of a certain cup. I mean, all of these like rituals that they had. And but for this party, what King Xerxes did, he had very exquisite um, cups made of gold for all the people that were coming and he didn't dictate though people drank when they wanted to but people drank a lot including him and so when they were very merry he decided he wanted to show off his queen 
which will be Queen Vashti. Now, I'm sure you're wondering why are they separate? Because in this day, this is the way it worked. The men party in one room and the women through a different party and they were separate. OK, so that's just the way it is. Remember, we have to take things based on where, the way they were in the context of which they were written. And so the king decided, hey, I want Vashti to come in here. I want her to wear her crown. I want to show her off. I want everybody to, you know, awe over her. And um, Vashti declined. Vashti was like, uh, that's not happening. Now, let me tell you a couple things about that. When you were a queen in those days, it wasn't even good for the common people to look on you. Like queens were covered up and all the things because, you know, it was, it, they had a thing about modesty and it wasn't commonplace for you to look at the queen. So that's why she was always covered up. So for the king to ask her to come out, wear your crown and I don't know, flounce in front of the people. Ooh, that didn't go over well. And so for a lot of reasons for Vashti, you know, Vashti, Vashti had some, her background, there were some issues in her background who were her forefathers. So that's a whole different thing. But Vashti gets a bad rap about, you know, how she handled the situation neither here nor there at this moment, but Vashti didn't come out. And so the king was very upset. So now we're at the fall of Vashti, king upset. Now here's what we can give to the king. Guess what? He didn't lose his cool completely and respond impulsively. So you got to give him credit for that. He in his wisdom, called his counselors together and said, how do we handle this situation? Now, how they handled the situation was a little funny to me because what they said was, wait, 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 wait. If your wife disobeys you, then that'll make our wives think they can disobey us. We can't have that happening. So off with Vashti, divorce done, never to be seen again. She can never come before the king again. And um, the king agreed. And um, yeah, so that didn't end of Vashti. That was done. So now we're working on the rise of Esther. And it took a number of years before the king was ready for um, a new queen. Now here's what happened. Months later, when the, queen was no, when the king was no longer as merry as he was before, you know, he started to rethink. Uh, oh my gosh, I don't have a queen. Wait a minute. I didn't think that through. But here's the deal about Persian law. This law, you the, when the king put his seal on it and made a law, you can't go back and like change it, reverse it. You It, it didn't happen. It was, it is, it's stuck, done. Okay. They didn't have a Supreme Court that can go in and change, you know, different parts of the law like we do here. No. Done, done, done. That's it. The end. And so he couldn't get Vashti back because maybe he wanted to change his mind later on, but that didn't happen. So years passed by and the king was like, I'm ready for a new queen. So back come the advisors. You know what they say? Hey, let's do a national search. We're going to go through all of your provinces and we're going to find the best of the best women. And we're going to bring them to you and we're going to let you decide. OK, so one unit was designated to prepare the contestants for the interview because it's like this big national I don't know, beauty contest is one thing you can call it. And so. You had a once you got in, like you were part of the group. There was an entire year where you had to prep to come before the king. You had one day to come before the king, but you prepped for an entire year. And so. Esther, who was an orphan, being raised by Mordecai, because her parents were um, no longer alive. So Esther got chosen to be part of this, these women that were going to go before the king. And guess what? Esther, of course, remember I told you it means star, impresses Haggai, he's the eunuch, so much that he starts giving her special attention and 
and giving her special instructions on what to do when she goes before the king. Now, we can call this Esther impressed Hagar. But what I like to say is Esther had favor on her life. God put favor on her so that it wasn't fair to all the rest of them, but God didn't have to be. So when she went before the king, she was going to have some, you know, a few little, few little extra things that she would know of um, that the eunuch had told her. Okay. And so this is what I wrote. I said, many people find themselves in the position of Esther to some degree. Okay. Life goes well. We're like, when life is going well for us, we forget about those that other people who are fearful and helpless and endangered because life is going well for us. But then while life is going well, guess what happens? The need may arise to get out of your comfort zone for the benefit of others, even if it involves a degree of risk. So our actions have to be based on faith that God will see us through any and all situations. And as a result, we might get to see God work in wonderful ways in our lives and in the lives of others. So that's one side of Esther. Here's the other side. Some of us find ourselves in Esther's previous position. Because remember, Esther was born in captivity. Because they were all in Babylon when, when Esther was born, okay? And Esther lost both of her parents and became an orphan. So some of us find ourselves in that situation, and that's tough, okay? So while things may seem like they can't get any worse than this, along comes an opportunity to go from what society considers the lowest, being an orphan, to what society considered one of the greatest being a queen. But here's my thing. Don't find yourself in such a place of comfort where you can't hear or recognize the call of God. Okay. Cause God may be calling you to do what? Come out of your comfort zone. Take a risk. Okay. And do for others. And so I, again, I have the same thing. Our actions must be based on faith that God will see us through any and all situations. And as a result, we might see God work in a wonderful way in our lives and in the lives of others. So that's our first part of Esther. Okay. So you see how God is working in the background. Okay. Persia, great nation, Vashti refuses to come, um, and do what the king says. And here God is working in the background. Like I'm about to make Esther a queen. I'm about to do some things with Esther. All working out. Now Esther in the front hand may be saying. I mean I don't even understand how God is thinking about me. Because remember I'm the orphan. But all of a sudden Vashti makes one decision. And her one decision changes the trajectory of Esther's life. And so then. We get to the next section, okay? And it talks about the influence of Mordecai. All right. Now, Mordecai was like pretty pretty high up um, under King Xerxes. He, he was one of the ones that sat at the gate and kind of kept a watch and knew things that were going on. That's who he was. He was a Jew, but he still had some authority. And um, Mordecai found out that two of the king's men were planning to assassinate him. So Mordecai tells Esther, because Esther has become the queen. Like, remember I told you Esther had favor? She went in. Out of all the women, the king found, like, oh, my gosh, she's the best. I forgot to tell you that part. She's the best. That's the one I want. Name her queen. And so Esther got named queen. Okay. So Esther's living in the palace. Life is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when Mordecai finds out about the assassination attempt on the king's life, he tells Esther and Esther goes in and tells the king. So when Esther goes in and tells the king, Esther, you know, makes sure it gets written down in the chronicles, 
because that's what they do. They write down history and they put them in the chronicles because remember, we're not, we didn't have the internet and all the things. So it gets written down and Mordecai goes on about his business. Esther goes on about her business. Now notice, let's stop here for a second. Notice how Mordecai didn't have to go to HR and want to file a complaint because he didn't get an award. Nobody talk, told Mordecai, hey, stand in front of the stage. We're going to all clap for you. Nobody patted Mordecai on the back. It just literally got written in the Chronicles and life went on. Now, Mordecai could have been like some of us want to you know, put it on the IG. Look what I did. I'm the reason the king is still living. I mean, Mordecai could have did a lot of things. All right. But Mordecai was Mordecai. He went back to work doing what he does best. Well, along comes this man came called Haman. Now they don't really tell you where Haman, like, you know, how he ended up in the story, but just all of a sudden it was like, there was Haman. And Haman gets name number two, like right after the king. It's the king and Haman. And the king tells, you know, Haman, you got all the authority. He gives him his ring so he can seal things. And uh, Haman goes out and he tells everybody, the king says, everybody bows down to Haman. So Haman is going on about his business. You know, people are bowing down. And, you know, it's always people out there watching, like, watching what's happening. So Haman doesn't really pay attention to Mordecai, but guess what? Some of the King's men, okay. His servants, they notice that Mordecai doesn't bow down to Haman. And so, you know what they did? They went and told Haman, which made Haman furious. Okay. Now, you got to remember, this is all about God working in the background. Haman didn't notice, but the other men did. So the other men did what? When and told, when he, when they told Haman gets furious because Haman figures out that Mordecai is a Jew. Why don't you bow down? Now, let me give you a background. Haman is the son of an Agagite. Mordecai is of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay. Which comes from the tribe of Saul. Now, Saul at one point had been told to kill King Agag. That's where Haman comes in. Um, but he, that was a whole nother thing. So the Amalekites, that's where King Agag is from. When Israel was first crossing over, you know, crossing, going to their promised land, the Amalekites were the first ones to attack them. And... From that point forward, there's always been this huge hatred and rivalry between the two. So Haman, being the son of Agagite, when he finds out that Mordecai is Jew, tribe of J Benjamin, the fury now goes from, I don't just want to kill Mordecai. I want the whole Jewish nation to be wiped out. So he sets a plan in place. So. What he does is he said, well, I can't go tell the king to just kill the Jews because he might not go for that. So what he does is he goes and tell the king, there's a group of people, doesn't even name who they are. There's a group of people and they are rebellious toward you. They don't follow the law as they should. They don't do what they are supposed to be doing. And so I'm thinking you might want to get rid of them. And so the king is like, yes, if someone's going to be rebellious against the kingdom, get rid of them. So he Write, doesn't eat it, write a letter and Haman seals it. And it's like, it's ready to go out to all of the provinces about it. Now, let me tell you how Haman figured out when the Jews, the Jews should die. Haman cast what's what they call a lot or, or pure. Okay. It's really like a die. And he used that to determine what date I'm going to have them annihilated. And the die comes up with a date and it's like months down the line. Like it's like a lot of months down the line, but Haman, wh what you got to remember about the Persian, which I haven't told you yet, but the Persian are very superstitious. 
even to this day, they still are. So they wholeheartedly believe if I cast this die, then what it tells me is what the God, not our big God, their gods want them to do. So that's what they did. Now we all know who is really in charge of everything, but that's not what they were doing. And so Haman mixes, you know, half truce and truce and gets the king to do what he wants to do. And then he added this little bit. Just in case he was thinking, you know, what if the king didn't want to do it? He added a bribe to go with it. You can add all of this money to the king's treasury. So the king was like, do it. Have at it. Be great. So all of these letters go out. And then the Jews are all frantic. Mordecai finds out about it. Mordecai and the Jews are, they start fasting. They're weeping. They're tearing their clothes. They're wearing sackcloth. And so Mordecai comes to the gate and he's standing at the gate with his sackcloth on wailing and weeping. And it's against the law to do this. But does Mordecai care? No, he's still doing it. So Esther finds out, oh, my gosh, what's happening to Mordecai? Because she hadn't gotten a letter because remember, she's in the cat. She's with the king. So she sends the messenger down. Find out what's wrong with Mordecai. And then she sends him some clothes because she was like, you can't be at the gate in the sackcloth. That's against the law. You can't do that. Mordecai sends the clothes back. He refuses to put them on and he tells Esther about what has happened. Haman has set a plot. The Jews are going to be annihilated. We're all going to die. You need to go before the king. So Esther sends back another message that said, I can't go before the king. You only come before the king when the king calls for you. So here's the rule in Persia. If you go before the king and he hadn't called you and he doesn't reach out his scepter to you and grant you favor, you die right there on the spot. They kill you. That's how it worked. We don't have to understand it. We just need to know that's the way it worked. Okay. Same way you used to dial a phone, either push the button or take the, take your finger and go around. Kids don't understand it, but we did. And if you missed the wrong button, remember you'd start all over again. So. It seems crazy to them. This seems crazy to us, but that's just the way it was. So Esther says, I can't do it. Can't, can't. I'm going to risk my life. I may die. And so Mordecai comes with the famous verse, 4 and 14, that says, hey, 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 Esther, let me, let me tell you a couple things. First of all, be not fool. How do you know that God didn't put you in the kingdom for such a time as this? You are where you are because God knew this time was going to come and he, he was pre prepping you for this so that you could be the reason, the vessel by which his people are rescued. He said, but let me tell you one more thing, Esther, just in case you don't want to listen to me. God's people will be taken care of. God will take care of his people if by you or not by you. But let me assure you, you are still a Jew. While you have hidden it from the king, you are a Jew. And just like my, all of us will be annihilated, you and your father's house will too. So don't think because you're in the palace, you won't be one of the Jews. Because when they find out that you're a Jew too, you are, you are part of the edict. You're dying too. So he had kind of like give, you know, Esther a little reality check. Girlfriend, you up there with all your nice clothes on, eating, doing all the things, being great. Get it together. You're still a Jew. And so Esther was like, okay, now that you said all of that, I got it. So here's what we're going to do. Esther said, I'm going to fast for three days. You and all the Jews. I want all the Jews in Susa to fast for three days. After that, then I'll know what to do. Okay. So. Let me tell you this. It is said that the Persian justice was swift. Like when they wanted something to happen, it happened immediately. Like when the two men were trying to assassinate the king and Mordecai got word to Esther and Esther told the king they died immediately. Immediately. But I want you to know that the justice of God is even swifter. Okay. There may come a time when an enemy of your past or the past generation, like from your forefathers, they may come before you knocking at your door. But what you need to remember that is that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which are also your past, that God, 
That's your ally. Mordecai found an ally in Esther. That's how he was going to get to the king. I want you to know the God of the universe is your ally. The God of your past. When I start thinking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then I come all the way through the prophets and I come all the way through the kings and the judges and come all the way through them and get myself to the gospels and I get myself to Jesus the Christ. And then I think about Paul and Peter with the Gentiles. That is the God who is your ally. He has already made provision for you prior to your even getting here. Prior to the enemy knocking on your door, prior to anything happening to you, prior to things going wrong, prior to all of that, the God of the universe, who is your ally, has made provision for you. Now, what I want you to keep in mind is that your faith is supplying the fuel that's necessary to get that provision to you. So the question is, is the, is it moving on a full tank? Because you've got a lot of faith or is it moving on fumes and every now and then it's putt, putt, putting. Okay. So you got to keep that in mind. You have an ally. You need some faith. Got to have faith that he's working in the background. And so that's that section. Okay. So then we're at the last section here. We have two banquets and a hanging. So Esther finally, you know, they fast, they do all the thing. Esther preps herself and she goes before the king. And when she goes before the king, guess what happens? Of course, favor of God. He reaches out the scepter and then he tells Esther because he finds favor with Esther. Like he looks at Esther and like, oh my gosh, it's something about you that makes me want to give you whatever you want. And he basically tells Esther. Whatever you wish, whatever it is you want, up to half of my kingdom, it is yours. Just tell me what it is and I'll grant it. And so, um, now remember, the king doesn't know that Esther is a Jew. Okay, not yet. And so Esther um, has to tell him that she's a Jew. And she also has to tell him that his top man, his number two closest companion, is a terrible villain. And so what Esther does is she, she says, um, I'm going to prepare a banquet for you and I want Haman to come too. So, um, that's what I want to do. And so Esther, the, you know, Haman comes to, um, the banquet, but Haman is, you know, Mad at Mordecai. Remember, he's still mad at Mordecai. So Haman comes to the banquet and Esther is going to ready to make her request. And she pauses. And the king says, what is it? What is it that I can give you? Now, Haman is happy go lucky because he's thinking, look at me. I'm invited to a dinner with just the king and the queen. I'm the man. Yes, yes, yes. So he's living high on the hog. So when he comes to the dinner, Esther says, I want to have a dinner number. I want to have a banquet number two. I want just you and Haman to come again. King says, okay, cool. Fine. So Esther doesn't tell him. Okay. She, she can't, she doesn't even know why she can't, but we all do. Cause God is amazing. So that night, Haman leaves. Mordecai doesn't bow down. Haman goes home, tells his family and friends. And sometimes you got to be really careful about who you talk to. Cause Haman goes home, talks to his family and friends about, you know, Mordecai not, and how furious he is that Mordecai is not bowing down. And his friends and family say, won't you just get rid of him, execute him. And he knows that he has this edict that they have a certain day that they're going to they're gonna annihilate the Jews. But he's thinking to himself, you know what, it's just one man. I'm not annihilating all of them. I'm going to leave them for later, but I'm going to go ahead and get rid of Mordecai. So Haman has a gallow, which is where, you know, you hang people, has a gallow built I want it built immediately. I want it in my backyard. I want it 50 cubic feet high. I mean, it's going to be huge. I want Mordecai to be strong out so the whole public world can see him, the whole thing. So he does that. 
And then he gets ready to go back the next day for the banquet, right? So Haman goes back, he's ready to go. And on his way in there, he's already determined that he's has figured out how he's going to get the, the king to sign another edict so he can hang Mordecai. Now, that's the Haman side. This is what's happening on the king's side. King gets ready to go to bed. The king can't sleep because God will make you sometimes not be able to sleep. So the king can't sleep. So the king says, hey, he's going to get him a little reading material. He has one of the servants. Bring me in the Chronicles and read me the Chronicle. Now, I remind you, the Chronicles is like the history. So, you know, there's a lot. So of all of the books he could have picked, guess which one he picked up? The one that had the information about Mordecai. So he brings it in. He's reading it to the king. King thinks he's going to go to sleep. And then he says, hey, now he remembers. Someone remind, like someone gave him the plot of being assassinated. He was like, who was that? Mordecai. He said, what did we do for Mordecai? The servant says, nothing. We just wrote it down in here. And he said, hmm. so he's thinking. So the next day, Haman comes in ready to like tell the king this new thing so he can get rid of Mordecai. But before Haman starts talking, guess who talks first? The king. He says, Haman, what should we do for a man who is taking care of the king? You know, he goes on and on and on about this man. Now, Haman being prideful and arrogant as he is, thinks he's talking about him. He thinks the king is talking about him. So Haman goes a list of stuff. You should give him your ring, give him your best coat. You should parade him around the city on your horse so everybody can know what's going on. I mean, just Haman is going on and on and on because he's thinking this is him. And then the king says, yes, do all of that for Mordecai. Well, guess what? Now you can't try to get the king to kill Mordecai because the king just told you to honor Mordecai. So um, Haman goes home and he is upset to no end. No end because he has to do all this stuff for Mordecai or whatever. So the next time Haman comes back before the king, this is actually, I'm sorry, that all that was the first banquet. This is actually the second banquet. The next time he comes back before the king, um, Esther says, the king says, you need to tell me what it is that you want. Because remember, I said up to half of my kingdom. And Esther says, well, I want my life to be saved in the life of my people because there is someone who is not only interested in selling us but they're interested in annihilating us like destroying us and the king says who is this person tell me who it is and Esther says Haman and so the king is furious he gets up he walks into the garden and so what happens is Haman one of the things about Persian when they ate they were they would recline on furniture it was just it was a custom okay they reclined on furniture. So Esther's reclined on the furniture and Haman goes to beg for his life. He falls down and bows before um, the queen begging her. And when the king comes back from the garden, because I guess he's cooled off a little bit, he comes back and he sees Haman basically sprawled out over the queen. The king did not ask any questions. He said, would you dare how dare you attempt to bring harm or what, whatever he thought he was doing to my wife while I am here. And he says, while the words are coming out of the king's mouth, the servants are on their way over. They cover Haman's face. And then one of the servants say, hey, guess what? Haman has a gallow built in his backyard. And the king says, hang him on it. And so. Off goes Haman. And uh, yeah, so Haman was gone. That was the end of that. And so the king gives all of the things, all that Haman owned, he gives it to Esther. Okay. And now, remember now Mordecai is already top, top man because he'd been honored. 
Now Esther has all of the stuff, all the material things. And so the king says, um, I, you still haven't told me what you want. Cause she, that was, you know, she said, I just want to tell you about this, that, but that wasn't like a request. I just want to give you this information, but she had never given him a request. Okay. And so she understood that you can't reverse a law that the king had made, but it doesn't mean that the king king, like not a king with a little K, the king with a big K can't come in and do whatever he wants to do. And that's what happened. So Mordecai comes in. He writes another law that says the Jews can not only defend themselves, but they can destroy anyone who comes against them. And that happened. Now, a little tidbit in this story. How interesting that Mordecai wanted. No, Haman wanted Mordecai to bow to him. And he got so furious over him not bowing. And then Haman ends up bowing to the queen. And the very thing that he wanted Mordecai to bow to him, that very thing, bowing, is the very thing that got him executed. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I'm telling you, God is just, sometimes I just like am beyond in awe of God. Because God will make the, the enemy definitely be at your footstool. So the story ends with um, the Jews end up going from weeping to celebration because they defend themselves. And even though the king told them that they could have everything, they could all the plunder, they could plunder it all, but they didn't want any of that. They just wanted to make sure that they um, weren't going to be annihilated. And then the in the, in the interim of all this happening, guess what? People started getting saved. People started saying, man, if you got a God like that, I want who I, I, I want to serve that God. And so a lot of people got saved during that time. And so I'm going to say this part. Sometimes the best decision you can make is a pause. Remember estimate the pause. She wanted to talk to the king. Oh, no, something in the inside called Holy Spirit said, don't do it. That pause may be the very thing that God was waiting for so that he can move on your behalf. Sometimes God is so busy, so busy dealing with us that we are limiting ourselves in what he can be busy doing for us, to us, with us. Uh, you know what I mean? Like he has to deal with us because we're making a mess of things and uh, we're whining, we're fussing, we're complaining, we're not where we're supposed to be. We don't like what we are, all the things. And so he's, over here comforting us when he could be doing a whole lot more in the background. So that pause could mean slow down, let it go, forgive, hush, pray, meditate, read, study, worship. A lot of things is what that pause could mean. But remember, the entire book of Esther turned around on her pause. She waited to make her request to the king. And that was the night that the king couldn't sleep, Mordecai, and then everything tumbled after that. And so uh, Mordecai gets the promotion. They have two days of victory, and then they get this celebration called Purim, which Purim, the word Purim is a plural of pure, because remember, more, uh, Haman used a pure, that's the die. He cast the die, um, the lot, to see what day. And so they made this celebration of that. Um, and so I said, when you allow God to promote you according to his will, his timing and his way, the end result is much more than what you could have ever imagined. God can remove the wealth of your enemy and transfer it over to you. Don't lose faith in what God can do with a sudden shift. The end result of whatever God does to promote or give to you is that there is a kingdom purpose attached to it. No blessing from God is for you and you alone. Our triune God works in a community and you are expected to do the same work in the community for the good of the community. And so that was the end of that. Now I talked about different nuggets. Okay. I talked about the providence of God. 
That's the hand of God in the glove of history. The work of God in order to fulfill his original design and his will. It's what some people call luck, chance, and happenstance. Okay? Um, there's nothing random about who you are in God. God's sovereignty and complete control is over everything. And um, I thought this was very interesting. Sovereignty is all about what God wants to happen. Providence is all about how God makes it happen. Okay. So. Um, other thing that you'll find in here is words that have to do with time. Like, wow. During the enemy's wow that has you waiting, God may be preparing a banquet. And it may be in the presence of your enemies. So don't. Don't shortchange that. Now is a timing word. When, then, after. Okay, don't put off doing what God has asked you to do while you meditate on the logistics of getting it all done. I'll do this after. I'll do this after God. That's not a good thing. Okay. Don't allow your then to be the reason you are not getting your blessing now. We sometimes forget who God is and have the audacity to say, if God does this, then I will. Okay, well, that didn't work. Okay. And then I also talk more about timing. You know, you should audit um, the way you spend your time. Where your time is spent, your life follows that. Where you spend most of your time leads you to understand what you really worship. Doing the right thing has to be God's timing in order to be declared and blessed right by God. All right. God is always worth the wait. How do you know when timing is right? When capacity is shrinking while your calling is expanding. When fear is overwhelming, yet your faith is unrelenting because fear creates mountains while faith moves them. When passion is burning, but the peace is calling. That's how you know the timing is right. All right. I talked about blessings um, in the kingdom of God. You're blessed to be a blessing. God never blesses you just for you. All right. Don't get comfortable in a place where God has told you to move from. Don't let your blessing become a curse. Do you want to be a conduit? That's by which things move through or you want to be a cul-de-sac where you kind of turn around and go back the other way. All right. God doesn't mind blessing you as long as he knows he can use you. Even when you're asleep, God is working things out. I talked about fasting. Remember Esther called a fast? Sometimes you wish you could fast forward to see how this is going to end. But that denies your faith the opportunity to grow and mature. Okay. Okay. Although you can't fast for it, you can't fast to spiritually move you forward in your faith. All right. Choose a fast fix over a quick fix. All right. By stepping in the presence of a king, you could do that or you can to the, step into the presence of the king. All right. Fasting is countercultural. It prepares you to serve more than consuming. Our culture is obsessed with consuming. All right. Abstaining is not eating food. Fasting is bringing the body under submission to seek the heart of God so that you can empathize with others and pursue God. That's what fasting is. All right. And I talk about what fixing takes place in a fast. There's a perspective fix. Your view can be shifted so you can see that God might be using the very thing that you think is going to destroy you. He's using that to bless, grow and mature you. He fixes your priorities. It's not about you, but rather about God and your experience in his presence. When you fasten your heart to God, he shifts your priorities. It's about a pace fix. The Holy Spirit has a schedule and he might just interrupt your pace because he knows the right things that need to be removed. And he wants you to get in rhythm with him. All right. So that you can match what heaven wants for you. I talk about um, enemies. God will allow unbelievers to express their anger against believers. Sometimes in order to the unbelievers can dig their own grave. That's what Haman did. All right. When everything seems lost and God can't be found, God is always working in the background to turn the plans of the enemies upside down. And then there's reversals all throughout the book of Esther because God is a God of reversals. Okay. God can reverse the things that we think can't be reversed. There in this, in the story of Esther, there's an economic reversal. There's a political reversal. 
There's a legal reversal. There's an emotional reversal. And then there's a spiritual reversal reversal. And then I talk about having a good opportunity versus a God opportunity. Sometimes God opportunities are disguised as obstacles. All right. Don't complain about the noise of opportunity knocking at your door. Every word out of your mouth is designing your future. All right. The right, the right perspective will help you see purpose in your pain. Sometimes opportunities are delivered through people. God brings them through a person. All right. Remind, James reminds us that God is the father of good gifts. Alignment is more important than assignment. All right. Opportunities widen for those who patiently prepare. Don't waste failures any more than you waste opportunities. Because failures are opportunities for lessons to be learned. All right. How you wait in life's traffic determines the level of your opportunity. All right. You should be living like God is already doing what you are waiting for. Because if you're ready, you don't have to get ready. Then I talk about just different things to ponder. You know, I talked about when Haman was at the feet of Esther, how that was the very thing he wanted. And that was the very thing that got him killed. All right. The book of Esther reflects on struggles of the Jewish exiles because they became too attached to the land of captivity. All right. This book challenges us to consider God's care and guidance, even when we are not in an ideal situation. His mercies do not depend on our location or even our own faithfulness. God's mercies are outpouring. They are outpouring of who he is in our lives. And so as you go through the book of Esther, I want you to keep pondering how God is working in the background of your life. It may not seem like it. It may not feel like it. You may not be able to see it, but he is God. He is sovereign and he is never not working in your life. And so keep that in mind every time when you're wondering, God, where are you? He says, I'm here working on your behalf. And so there is so much more I could talk about with Esther, but I have talked like way longer than I presumed I would, but it's I, Esther is just my, I, ah, excited to talk about the providence of God. And so I want to thank you for traveling through the word with me. I know that it is after 12 when I am posting these and it's February 28th. And I said I was going to post them by Sunday, but I'm still going to post them before I go to bed tonight because I said I would. So that's what happened. Mirror Talk is coming tomorrow. Uh, I'll take um, my verse from Esther and do a mirror talk. But for tonight, thank you for traveling. I hope that you spend March working through the book of Esther. And then at the end of March, I'll have another book for you that you can spend April working on because that's how we do this thing. So thank you so much for traveling with me more than, you know, I appreciate you have a wonderful time in Esther.